Hello and welcome to Pharma Television News Review here at Bio Europe in Milan, Spring 2011. On this show, I have Gary Rabin, who is Interim Chairman and CEO of Advanced Cell Technologies, otherwise known as ACT. Welcome to the show. Good to see you, Fintan. Thanks. Um, Advanced Tech Cell Technologies, tell us about that company. What's your specific goal and business driver is? We use uh, embryonic stem cells as the progenitor cells to create therapy programs that can be used in the clinic. And in fact, um, we have been approved by the FDA to begin two clinical trials uh, focused on the subretinal space in the eye. Uh, there are a significant number of retinal degenerative diseases, and, and that's the main clinical area of focus for the company right now. Right. And when was the company actually founded? 1998, but uh, the company really began to focus on taking it from a research, pure research company into a more commercial company starting around 2005. Right. And of course, there was always difficulties in the regulatory space in those early days. Oh, indeed. Well, even still, in fact, the company has just developed a technology that we were just issued a patent upon that we think is going to be a massive differentiator for our company going forward. The traditional way in which embryonic stem cells are harvested is through the extraction of the inner, inner cell mass of an embryo, and that destroys the embryo. That has been, in particular in the US, uh, but also even here in Italy, a very controversial area because the destruction of a fetal embryo is you know, a significant political, legal, regulatory, moral, ethical conundrum for a lot of people. So we have developed this technology where we take a much earlier stage embryo, an eight cell embryo, and we extract a single cell out of that embryo and use that as the progenitor cell for uh, our cell therapies. This is identical to a technology that has been used in in vitro fertilization called pre-implantation genetic diagnostics and has been used for a few years. And thousands of babies are born every year where there's been this removal of this cell to test for severe genetic defects like Tay-Sachs and Huntington's and others. Sure. So, and this is, this is a big advance for us. So now we believe that we've solved this conundrum of destroying embryos in the name of science. We don't any longer destroy embryos in the name of science. And in terms of your clinical programs, where are they focused? What specific therapy areas are you going for? So <clears throat> we have created, using these embryonic stem cells, we have turned those cells into retinal pigment epithelial cells. So those are the cells that sit at the back of the subretinal space in front of the Brooks membrane and photoreceptors, and they feed trophic factors to the photoreceptors, the rods and cones that keep them healthy. When the RPE cells die off, as they do in dry age-related macular degeneration, which has a patient population of 10 to 15 million in the US and 10 to 15 million in Europe, uh, when those RPE cells die off, there's a corresponding failure of the photoreceptors. And when the photoreceptors begin to die, that's when your vision begins to, to deteriorate and you go blind. So <clears throat> we've been cleared by the FDA to begin trials for two therapies. The first is dry age-related macular degeneration, and the other is Stargardt's macular dystrophy, which is a horrible juvenile form of macular dystrophy, also impacting the subretinal space. Right. This is obviously, um, this whole area is, is, is the where groundbreaking stuff's gonna happen in the future. From, from a business perspective, how, what is the business model then for a company like ACT? Well, right now, we obviously are deficit funding ourselves through our own capital. Sure. Uh, ultimately, we of course plan to commercialize this product, probably in partnership with a large uh, pharma or biotech that has penetration into the ophthalmologic surgeon market. Sure. And the, the therapy that we're doing is the subretinal injection of 50 to 200,000 RPE cells suspended in saline, 150 microliters of saline. So this is a very easily scalable, transportable model that looks very much like a traditional uh, pharma product or biologic. Right, which is obviously part of a procedure that um, that has to be done by surgeons. Yeah, it's not, not too dissimilar from Lucentis, for example, another subretinal injection that's a three, three and a half billion dollar worldwide market. So the rest of the pharmaceutical industry will, help, will, will understand it as a, as a particular business model to go yeah. forward with it. Now, in terms of your own funding, um, you're, you're, you're a publicly quoted company? We are, ticker advanced uh, ACTC. Right, and um, what is it like to try and raise money for a company like yours, particularly in, in today's environment? Well, 
I've only been the chairman and CEO for about uh, three months, but <clears throat> the company historically has had a hard time. Traditionally, companies at our stage, maybe they're public now, but we would have only been public recently. You would have had a big slug of venture capital kind of carrying the company through these pure research and, and clinical development years. And so we had to raise money in the public capital markets. We had to do some very adverse death spiral convertible debentures and so forth to get us through this period. But happily, the company is finally through that. We are basically debt free. We have $15 million in cash uh, on the balance sheet. And I can draw down another $21 million under a fully funded equity commitment whenever I want. So we're burning about $2.3 million a quarter. I have 15 in cash on the books. So we're for the first time in the company's history in pretty good financial condition. And in terms of I mean, we're looking at similarities to taking a normal drug through through clinical trials. What are the 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 hurdles? Are there is it is it a shorter route to go with 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 uh, cell therapy? Well, because we were using embryonic stem cells as our progenitor cells, we had a big job to do at the FDA to convince them that we weren't going to be injecting anything into anyone's eye that wasn't a terminally differentiated RPE cell, right? These cells start as, as embryonic stem cells, which by definition can become any, any kind of cell in the body. So we, our assay is extraordinarily exact, and we will not be injecting any tissue, any cells into the eye that are not terminally differentiated RPE cells. So that was a major safety hurdle to us. After that, to prove efficacy, what we need to show is that these cells, or some even very modest portion of these cells, lay down at the back of the retina there and attach or engraft to the Brooks membrane layer, which is this layer that sits at the back of the retinal space. And um, so you go through how many f uh, phases of clinical trials? So, so we've been therapy? approved for what's called phase one, two in the US for both of these therapies. In phase one, for both of the two therapies, Stargardt's and Dry AMD, we'll be enrolling 12 patients. <clears throat> we uh, will start patient enrollment very soon. We will be uh, putting our first patients into the clinic sometime late in the uh, first half of this year. Each, each uh, trial is set up as four uh, patient, or, sorry, four um, uh, sets of three patients each. Uh, the first patient will be injected with a relatively small dosage. Six weeks later, we'll inject patients two and three, and then so forth as we escalate the dosage through all 12 uh, patients. Okay. And then when do you think you would have a product on the market or ready for? Well, hopefully we'll be able to be in phase two by early 2012. And we believe because the subretinals, there are a lot of advantages to working in the eye. The two most distinct is, uh, are that the subretinal space of the eye is an immune privileged area. So it doesn't interfere with the vascular system of the body very much. So we are not anticipating any kind of immune rejection. That's a big advantage. The other really big advantage is that I can image the eye down to the cellular level. So if you were my first patient, I can take a cellular image of your retina, of your photoreceptors, rods and cones, and RPE layer, right down to the cellular level. I know exactly what's happening. I'm going to make my injection. We're going to follow up with retinal scans every week. And so by six weeks in, I'm going to know pretty well what's happened to those cells I injected. I'll know how they've attached. And I'll be able to, at that point, even measure some function of performance of your photoreceptor layer. So when you get to, um, with this particular first line therapy that you're, you're, you're developing, what other um, therapies are you, are you exploring? At the As a company. As a company. Well, we, there are 200 retinal diseases that we believe we can treat. Our next IND is going to be for myopic macular dystrophy, which has a huge Asian population. It's as actually prevalent in the Asian population as it is in the U.S. senior population. So we think this is a very big opportunity for us. And then there are a whole bunch of other subretinal spaces. But we also have a front of eye therapy that we're working on. We have developed corneal endothelial tissue. And so we're developing a corneal program. There are 10 million-ish Americans that need uh, corneal transplants or some kind of adjustment to the front of the eye. We believe this is a big market for us. Beyond that, though, we're focused also on using our 
embryonic stem cells as the progenitor cells for what are called hemangioblasts, which is the second major area of clinical focus for us. Hemangioblasts are the stem cells that become all of the other uh, cells in your circulatory and vascular system. And so we have, in the lab, we have made universal donor red blood cells and platelets out of these hemangioblasts. Obviously, that could be a very attractive market because the red blood cell and platelet markets today are donor-driven markets. And so to have a pathogen-free form of red blood cells and platelets obviously could be a very attractive market for us. And then there are all kinds of other things that we can treat in the vascular system. In the lab, we have taken a mouse that had a left uh, leg fully ischemic with no blood flow whatsoever, the kind of uh, failure you might see in a, an advanced diabetic patient. And after injecting the hemangioblasts, we see that leg return to normal blood flow within 30 days. So there are big opportunities for us in this area of blood flow, circulatory system, diabetes. So focusing on these hemangioblasts is going to be our next area of, of key clinical focus. And um, finally, do you believe that the regulatory environment now is conducive to your company being successful? What remaining, what remaining hurdles do you have? Well, well, first of all, right now, our cell lines are not eligible for NIH funding. The definition of what would be an acceptable cell line is still an open question in the U.S. And so obviously, getting NIH funding would be helpful as we take the next set of therapies into the clinic. But we believe that the regulatory overhang of the embryonic stem cell companies has been eased a lot because of Geron's success in getting their human trials to begin and ours to begin as well. It took Geron two years to get through the agency to get approval to begin their human therapies. It took us one year for our first, but only 30 days for our second. So we think that the FDA is now coming to understand that if you have the proper assays, if you take the proper care, that you, you are not going to inject undifferentiated embryonic stem cells or some short uh, follower to that into a person's body. We're, we're focusing on developing therapies that can be used, that are safe from the perspective of teratomas and tumors and all the sorts of things that you might be worried about in undifferentiated cells. So we think the regulatory environment has gotten a lot friendlier for us. Obviously, the success of Geron Safety Trial and the success of our safety trial will raise the profile of this industry. It's an industry that for 10, 15 years, there's been so much hope pinned on. In the United States, there's this fellow, Christopher Reeve, who was Superman. And he had this uh, spinal accident and ultimately died. And it was around the time of his spinal accident that people became aware of the opportunities sure. around stem cell science. And now, just this year, 2011, we're actually going to see the reality of this in the clinic. So it's very exciting. Gary Rabin, thank you very much indeed for coming on the show. Indeed, thank you. Yeah.